by the fact that we are a membership organization now, but we're uh, also an open organization. So everybody, if you're a member or not, you're welcome to come in, join in the conversation, and hopefully at the end of it, you'll want to join the, become a member as well. So why are we here? Uh, we've got a whole bunch of stuff planned for you. I'm going to give a board report, and Patrick will come up and entertain us with uh, some stuff about the election. Uh, the board candidates are going to get up here and talk about themselves. Um, then we'll hear from the development committee, and we'll get to hear. This will be really exciting. Uh, Dwayne's going to come up and talk about our finances, um, but he's going to talk about uh, future events. And then, actually, the most fun part is the open discussion at the end, where we want to hear from you. Uh, we want to know what your concerns are, what we can do uh, as the board and the various committees to make things better for you, the members. So I'm going to start off with my board report. I am Steve Feldman. I am the chair for another three and a half days. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for coming. What we did last summer, we had a great deal of fun this summer. The board all got together and went on a retreat. Yes, it's just what you think. It's just like in Dilbert, we went to a fancy tropical resort, lounged around by the swimming pool, and uh, drank Mai Tais, and no, no, not quite. Actually, we were in beautiful Fremont, California, in a corporate office park. Uh, AMS, thanks for hosting us, by the way. We were in, in their conference room. Uh, we actually did have coffee and some sandwiches. Uh, so that part was good. Um, uh, we weren't there either just to have a good time. We were there to actually work. We spent a whole day walked in this conference room except for the walk in the middle and uh, talked about what Nanog is going to become. Um, and we'll get to that in a, a moment. But the probably the biggest thing that we talked about is this. Why? Why does Nanog exist? <coughs> What's our purpose in life? So here's the quick answer. Nanog is educational and operational and whatever. Um, by the time I'm done explaining this to my grandmother, she's going to be sound asleep. So this isn't a good answer to why. This is actually a good answer to what, perhaps. But why is a more important question. Um, there. So uh, the facilitator of this retreat spent a good deal of time talking to us, and, and it really resonated, um, about how successful organizations start off by figuring out why they exist and work from there to what it is they do. Um, most times, if, for example, if you go out and buy a computer, a computer company is going to say, hey, we make these really great computers, buy some. Um, he used Apple as his example. Um, you can take that with the appropriate grain of salt, but maybe this week is appropriate. Um, Apple has a vision for what they build and why they build things the way they do. And that's what they're selling to you, not just cool hardware. Um, so he challenged us to think about why we're doing stuff. Why does that exist? Um, yeah, we all come to conferences, and we have mailing lists, and we have endless arguments about stuff. But there's a reason for that. And this is what we came up with. We are here collaborating to make the internet better. That's something I can explain to my grandmother. Um, I can explain to people I meet in an elevator. Um, they won't be asleep by the end of the sentence, and it actually makes sense to them. We come here together to exchange information, and knowledge, um, drinks, whatever. But we're here because doing so, we believe, makes the internet better. Um, that's a good reason. That's something that's easy to articulate, easy to explain, and it motivates kind of the rest of what we're doing here this whole week, if you ask me anyway. So I'll get to a bit more about the retreat in a bit, but um, let me move forward a bit. I'm only spending one slide on what we've done uh, over the last uh, 18 months since we started this whole adventure. Uh, started with nothing. We got some initial donations and support. Um, lots of advice, um, and we worked with uh, our partners at Merit to um, figure out how to separate ourselves and become an independent organization. We did that. We've expanded the sponsorship model, so we have real money coming in, and we have a positive cash flow. Uh, Dwayne can tell you all about that in a little while, but that, that's a huge thing for us. Um, we weren't sure at the beginning we could do that, but we did. And this here in Philadelphia is the first meeting that we've done completely on our own. Um, that has pluses and minuses. Um, sorry, there might be a few rough edges here. Hopefully they're minor ones and you won't even notice them. But on the whole, we're here. There's a room, there's lights, there's sound, uh, there's tables. That means that things are actually working. Um, also wanted to thank those of you who came and registered at the last possible moment. Um, that's nice uh, additional revenue. Um, it doesn't mean it's a little tight in the back there for which we apologize, but you know, 
too many people is not a bad problem to have, if you ask me. Um, I was going to come up with a slide, a list of people to thank, um, but it started getting way too long. So um, I'm going to start by just thanking everybody who came, all of you. You're the members, you're the community, you're the reason why we're here collaborating to make the internet better. Um, a few specific, not people, but types of people I wanted to call out. Uh, there were the initial people who sat around with us and helped us figure out how to go forward, how to take this idea and turn it into a reality. Um, there were those people who <coughs> told us we were a bunch of idiots and then explained why we were idiots and told us what we could do better. Um, that was really useful constructive advice and maybe we didn't enjoy listening to it at the time, but it did help us go where we are, so thanks to you guys. Um, thanks to uh, the people who became members, the people who come to the conferences, all of you. Um, <coughs> thanks even, even to Patrick. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what's next? We, we have uh, somewhere to do here, we're not, we're not just completely really finished. On the operations side, um, uh, we need to smooth out a whole bunch of rough edges. Like I said, hopefully you're not seeing too many of them from where you're sitting, um, but there are things, this is our first meeting, there are things we can obviously do better the next time, um, and that's all part of increasing efficiency. Uh, if we can avoid little problems, everything runs smoother, cheaper, faster, whatever. But what we really need to focus on is what we spent the rest of the time doing in our board retreat, which is a strategic vision. We need to figure out not where we are today, because we we're here already, we've been doing a lot of the same stuff for years and years and years, but what do we want to be tomorrow? Um, there have been a lot of ideas over the years of what Nana could do. We're in a position now where if we want to, we can make them happen. Um, <clears throat> we can collaborate to make the internet better. So let's do that. Um, we spent, like I said, a bunch of time in, in the retreat coming up with strategic goals for the next year to five years, uh, financial goals, uh, other goals, types of things that we could do, like expanding educational opportunities, that sort of thing. Um, but we can't do a whole lot of that without understanding what the membership of the community wants wants us to be. Um, so that leads to the next slide. How? And the answer is with your collaboration. Um, you can collaborate by voting in this election. Uh, you can collaborate by joining now if you're not already a member and you want to have a voice in how we do things. You can collaborate by volunteering. There's a whole bunch of opportunities. It is too late for this year, but next year there's going to be yet another board election with um, a couple, at least one person terming out, so there's going to definitely be at least one empty seat. Um, there's a program committee selection cycle going on now. If you want to be on the program committee or if you think you're interested, uh, put your head in the ring or talk to an existing PC member and find out what it's all about. Um, you have until Tuesday evening, I think, to decide and, and put your head in the ring. Uh, the development committee is going to need new members, um, always needs new members, we need new ideas, new uh, people to go out and get money for us. Uh, we need people to speak in these conferences. Um, Dave and the crew put together a really good program for us this time, as they always do, but uh, pro probably the biggest task is going out and recruiting talks, so why not make things a little easier for them by volunteering, uh, talk about something you're interested in that you think the rest of us uh, can learn by knowing about. And there's a bunch of other ways. So I'm not going to get into because we'd be here all night. But uh, work with us, collaborate, um, give us advice, tell us what you want, join, um, vote, uh, participate. So finally, again, we're here collaborating to make the internet better. Next up, uh, Patrick is going to talk about the election process and um, things you're going to be voting on. If you remember, in the next day or two. Hi everybody, my name is Patrick Gilmore, and I am in a, a wrong meeting. We are here to discuss the election process for NANOG, NUNOG, whatever you want to call it this week. Um, it turns out that 250 people have actually paid their $100 and become eligible to vote for the NANOG elections. Uh, in case it isn't clear to anybody, NUNOG actually was transferred the name NANOG from Merit to the NUNOG, dot, uh, NUNOG Incorporated, so we can call ourselves NANOG now. Um, but the incorporation is still NUNOG at the moment. 
So if I use the names interchangeably, please forgive me. 250 people, 252 people are eligible to vote. You don't need to be present to vote, but you do need to vote because just like the elections in anything else, and democracy works by the participation of, of the democratized. So you use this thing called ARO, which all of you have used because you are here at Nanog, and to get this little badge around your neck, you had to use ARO. Is that right? Everybody's looking at me. Okay, that's right. So you all have an account in ARO, or ARO as they like to call it, and you will all uh, be able to vote. If you need any help with that at all, just email support at nanog.org, and they'll be happy to help you out. Voting ends Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's the time zone you're in right now. So, uh, well, all the people here. If you're watching this on the stream, then you may not be. But otherwise, it's the time zone where Nanog is. The results will be announced Wednesday morning. Remember, Nanog doesn't actually end Tuesday night. Contrary to popular belief, it does go through Wednesday at noon. So hang out, see the results, and see what happens. I really need all of you to vote. Anybody who doesn't vote, you know what'll happen. So. There's a couple of things on the uh, ballot. It's not just uh, voting for board members. There's actually more things than that. There are ballot amendments. Um, in, the original, uh, in the original bylaws, it was, the board was given the right to change the bylaws by unanimous consent. But those bylaws changes had to be put for election at the very next election. The board actually did change the bylaws because the original bylaws had a very complicated structure for the membership. That was by the community, that means you people, decided that that was a little silly. So what we did is we simplified them greatly. Those simplified membership um, requirements are actually uh, the way that we do membership here at Nanon is up for election. If you guys do not ratify that, it goes back to the original bylaws. So you need to vote, you need to vote yes or no, your opinion does matter. There's only 252 of you, every single vote does really count. I'm not talking about like a national election where millions of people and things like that. Every single vote does matter here. So please get onto the webpage and vote. There are also um, four board members that are up for election. It turns out um, that we only have four people up for election for four empty seats. So I think you can probably guess the results of that election. However, it's not as simple as that. It turns out that we have three board members that are up as normal, it turned, uh, there, are six not, there are six non-executive, six elected board members. Of those every year, three are re-elected. One of whom is termed out. He cannot stand for re-election. That would be our amazing chairman, Steve Feldman, who has actually been a, a ridiculous amount of help getting the new organization going. Uh, it turns out somebody else also resigned in the middle of his term. So we, are, we have appointed somebody, Mike Smith. Mike, raise your hand. Um, but because he was appointed by the rest of the board, he needs to be elected or somebody needs to be elected into that place. Because of the way the elections work out, because of where the resignation happened, we have three two-year terms that are coming up and one one-year term because the term of the person who resigned, who is Rob Seastrom, and we thank him for his help, but because of the when he resigned, he only gets one year left on his term. It, this means that your, elect, uh, that your votes do count again because the person who gets the fewest number of votes will get that one-year term and the other three will get a two-year term. So even though it looks like you have four people for four uh, places and it doesn't really matter, it does actually matter. So please get on the webpage and please vote. So membership structure. Turns out anybody can join. Doesn't really matter. You can be you know, on the South Pole never attended a NANOG meeting, never read the mailing list, and you can join if you want. What this generally means is we want 100 bucks. So give us 100 bucks, you can be a member. We're happy to. So there's only one membership class. The nice thing about the membership class is that if you actually join, you get $25 off your, uh, uh, off your fees to come to NANOG. If you come to three NANOGs a year, it means it literally costs you $25 to come to NANOG per year. Isn't that awesome? You guys want to, I mean, sorry, be a member per year. Isn't that awesome? You guys all want to be members now. Anybody who is in this room and not a member, raise your hand. Uh, Jeff is, Jeff is, Martin? <laughs> Guess who's getting hit after this. <laughs> okay, I will find the two of them and beat them silly until they give me $100. 
Um, members can the real difference between uh, people who can vote. Uh, sorry, the real difference between a member and a, and a non-member is that members can vote. So you can elect people like me. If you think I'm silly, then you don't have to vote for me. It's kind of strange I'm standing up here given that statement, isn't it? But if you are a member, you can vote, and that's what you should do. You should become a member. You should vote. So. Please vote for the membership class because if you do not, it will revert to the old way, which I don't think was perfect. It wasn't bad, but I think the new way is good. Dwayne? Okay. So, moving on. Committee simplification. This is another thing that we went through. When we started, we had some grandiose ideas, and they actually made sense at the time. But as organizations evolve, we need to change slightly. So one of the things we decided to change, for instance, is we combined a couple of the committees. The finance and event committees are being combined into a single committee. This makes sense given where we're gonna go forward. So the board is also allowed at its leisure to create ad hoc committees. To ensure that we're not just creating a mil million committees and for no apparent reason, it turns out that anybody who is a chairman of any committee is in non-voting but still a member of the board of NANOC. So we have some board members up here who are not actually elected to the board, such as Dave and Masako. They are the chairman of individual committees and they get to come to all the board meetings, they get to voice their opinions, they get to see all the mail that goes back and forth, all the minutes that we produce, and everything else that happens. And there are a few other cleanups, really minor you know, vocabulary stuff and language that needed to be changed slightly. And we'd appreciate it, you know, the board clearly thinks that these are good ideas, we put it onto the ballot, but just because the board thinks it's a good idea, doesn't mean it is. The backstop of all of this, the thing that really matters is the community, and you're the community. So you guys need to actually read these things, <laughs> see if they make sense, and vote on them. Voting being the most important part, so if you don't wanna read them, Come to me and I'll tell you how to vote. How's that sound? <laughs> so the board candidates, this is a really long URL. I made Steve put this URL in instead of just go to nanog.org so people on the stream can go ahead and click on the URL. There are actual candidates. They have um, some statements that they've made and they have you know, their bio and why they think they should be elected and things like this. And this will help you decide which ones should get the two year uh, term and which ones should get the one year term. So. There are four candidates. Unfortunately, one is not able to be here right now. Uh, he did make a statement that I will be reading for him, but before that, uh, going just in alphabetical order by first name, what we're gonna do is uh, start with Dwayne, and we're gonna read each of the statements, and then we're gonna have a Q&A where you guys can stand up and actually ask them questions. Um, where, uh, where this idea comes from, it's actually called a hustings, which means that you guys get to um, Grill is a polite way of putting it. Beat the crap out of them is another way of putting it. Actually ask them really hard, tough questions. Make sure that your ideas, that your view, that you, what is important to you is asked of these people. See what they think. And then hold them accountable to that, okay? So with no further ado, I'm gonna start with Dwayne and I'm gonna go get my iPad so I can read uh, Steve's statement afterwards. <clears throat> So hello, hello, uh, I'm Duane. I was uh, totally unprepared to go first. Um, <laughs> I have uh, very little to say other than um, I would not be uh, totally disappointed if I got the fewest votes and therefore only had <laughs> one more year to serve Still on the board. But, um, no, it's, it's been a, my pleasure to, to be on the board for the last two years. I'm the treasurer and you get to hear me talk a lot about that later. Um, otherwise, I would just encourage you to, to vote. Um, I think <coughs> some of the other issues are a little bit more important than the, the board candidate since we've got four, four for four, so I think that's kind of, uh, <coughs> but otherwise, please go out and vote. Thanks. Michael, yeah. Next. Okay. <laughs> I'm Mike, oh. I'm Mike Smith, um, formerly Communications Committee Chairperson. So. Um, I really do think it's unfortunate that there are only four of us because it does kind of limit your options as to what you can actually do in the democratic process that Patrick was referring to. Um, so that would definitely be one of my target goals for either one or two years, um, is to make sure that there's a bigger slate of candidates the next time around. Um, 
and also now that we're flush with cash, which Dwayne will talk about, um, using some of that for community outreach to make sure that we have the next generation of uh, people that are a little less gray than the, all of us um, coming to this meeting so that this continues on beyond all of us. Thanks. Uh, perhaps because Steve isn't here, he actually prepared a statement. <laughs> uh, sorry. The candidates were told they were going to make a statement before the husbands. So I apologize uh, if this thing is a little bit longer than the last two, but I promised Steve that I would read this. Let's hope I can do it. First, I'd like to apologize for being one of those people who runs for the board and then doesn't show up to say what they should be elect why they should be elected. I have some non nanic friends who didn't make uh, let me try this again who didn't take Nanog into account when scheduling their wedding, so I'll be arriving in Philadelphia on Monday night. I've been reading the Nanog mailing list since 1997 or 1998. Uh, I will read comments out. And attending Nanog meeting regularly since 2000. Nanog has taught me a lot and been an incredible valu valuable resource. <coughs> I enjoy contributing the organization as a conference speaker, as one of the authors of the 2005 Merit Nanog Charter, and of the bi current bylaws that the organization operates under and as Nanog's membership chair since January. The current Nanog board has taken the organization through a period of great change over the last two years. They've done an impressive job of converting Nanog from an activity to, of a university consortium into an independent organization, <coughs> or uh, sorry, independent industry organization with minimal disruption. I'm running for the board, hoping to continue that work, but also because I'm excited about other possibilities for Nanog. <coughs> During two years of work to bring Shut up, During two years of work to bring an organization through a dramatic change in governance structure would be, would be rather disappointing if it stopped there. Nanog has put on a good conference and will continue to do so. But what's exciting about our new structure is that it will allow us to do more. I'm interested in exploring the possibilities for what else Nanog can do to make the internet better. Many of our counterpart organizations elsewhere in the world have workshop programs to train the next generation of workshop, uh, sorry, next generation of network engineers, it would be nice to do something like that here. I'd like to see Nanog support the best practice documentation work from a few meetings ago. I'd like people setting up topic specific network operations mailing lists, the various router dash NSP lists, the security lists, the outages <coughs> list, for example, to be able to use Nanog's mailing list infrastructure rather than having to set up their own. In general, I'd like to see Nanog become a full-fledged professional organization for the network operators community rather than an organization that runs a few big meetings and leaves the community to set up duplicate infrastructure for everyone else. Since I'm running unopposed, I guess you'll be electing me whether or not, whether you want to or not, but I'd appreciate your votes anyway. Again, I'll be arriving tomorrow night and would be happy to answer any questions at that time. Just to be clear, um, Steve is unelected and unpaid, but he's put in a tremendous amount of time and effort to the organization. He did write the bylaws, he came to our retreat. He's done a lot of things for the organization with essentially no thanks. So I want to be, even though he didn't put this in his personal statement and I probably shouldn't uh, bias anybody towards him, just want you to know that he really has done a lot of work and he is good for the organization. Hello, good afternoon. <coughs> I'm Sylvie Le uh, So I'd like to volunteer. I. Um, I do believe that making the internet better is a valuable cause, and I do think it's worthwhile that I devote time to it. So I have the time, the energy, and also the desire to continue what was started here at Nanog. So I'm see seeking a second mandate, uh, essentially to continue the transformation, and also I like to finish what I started. Uh, I'd like also to explore ways of doing other things with Nanog. Is it education? Is it best operating practices? I want to listen to you and implement what your desires are. This organization is ours, and we need to shape it to what we believe is important. So that's it. I'm not going to take more of your time. Um, thank you very much for coming to NANAG. It's important. All right. So now we have the Q&A, which I'm hoping it will be more than just all of you staring at me. Two things. Uh, the first is, 
Anybody who's watching on the stream, I am on the IRC channel. Um, if you don't know how to reach me, you don't deserve to be part of Nano. So feel free to uh, <laughs> feel free to message me, uh, and I will um, read your question out loud. Otherwise, uh, please go to the microphone so people on the stream can hear you, and I would love to hear your questions. Just so you know, um, we want this to actually happen, and we do want some questions, but we don't want this to last 10 hours. So do me a favor and don't repeat other people's questions unless there's an actual, you know, important point behind it. Todd. Uh, I have a question for you first, Patrick. Todd, who are you? Uh, I'm Todd. <laughs> and you work? Todd, I'm Todd, I work for Google. Uh, my question for you, Patrick, is I got confused. Are we supposed to vote or not vote? <laughs> <laughs> that was just... I would appreciate if all of the members voted except Todd. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you for that clarification. To the candidates, actually, Dwayne, uh, and it's for all of them, Dwayne hinted at what I think is the most significant question, which is um, how much money should we save and what should we do with that money? Um, that's, that's a good question. Get a microphone right there. <laughs> um, okay, how much money should we save? Uh, we talked about this a little bit in our retreat, um, so you may get kind of the same answer from everybody. Um, our, our goal for the end of 2012 was to have 100,000 cash and for 2013, uh, 250,000 buffer. Um, so that, that, that's our target. And, that, and you know, I, I, think, I think that's realistic. I think that's pretty good. So I'll, I'll talk about this later again, but you know, that money goes to sort of cover our liabilities in the case that we have a meeting that totally falls apart and so on. Um, you know, beyond those numbers, I don't, I don't think uh, Nanog needs a lot more than that. So what Todd's saying that nobody can hear is what should we do with the extra money? If there is extra money, what should we do with it? Um, <laughs> I could use a raise. <laughs> well, I, th I, think, I think some of these ideas are going to come out uh, later in the meeting. Um, I, I think if we were in the situation where we sort of did everything that we wanted to do with our extra money, um, I would like to see um, you know, some of that money going back to the sponsors and maybe lowering the sponsorship fees. Because okay, uh, I think they've been very generous to us. I'd actually like the other candidates, if they... Yeah desire to uh, explain, uh, answer the last questions. What else, what could we do with the extra money? Because I don't think that's just a treasurer thing. If you don't want to answer, that's fine too. No, it's fine. I'd like to see more outreach towards um, not only more uh, participation for the program, but also, um, again, what I was saying before, making sure that we continue this on beyond the present group of people. Um, so I think using some of that for community outreach and, dare I say it, marketing, which I know is a verboten word in operations, but still, um, spending some of that money to get the Nanog name out there in the community and make it, it continue to be important, I think, is uh, a good way to spend extra dollars. Sylvia, do you have any comments? Yes, I would like to um, devote some money to prepare the, the next generation, making sure that the appropriate level of knowledge and education is imparted onto them and making sure too that we develop best practices and that we train the next generation of network engineers for our industry. As right. I'm noticing my new gray hairs. Uh, since Steven isn't here, um, not answering for him, but I think he actually said some of that in his statement so you should consider that and I'd be happy to forward a statement to anybody who's interested. Next. Oli Jacobs and Cisco, um, does this have to be a question? No. Okay. I'll turn it into a question anyway. Uh, do you guys plan to change your mission statement? Uh, so that It'll sounds be, more like a board level thing, but I think I'll let the answer. It, it, I'll explain the question. Uh, RFC 3935, the goal of the IETF is to make the internet work better, which sounds like exactly your mission statement. You might want to sort of reward yours. <laughs> um, so theft is good. Th theft is good. Sylvie? When we uh, launched the transition, we said that we wanted to keep the same mission that we had and that we wanted to expand it with education. And we, when we asked ourselves, why are we here, it came clear to us that we're here to collaborate to make the Internet better. So maybe that's that collaboration thing that's not part of the ITF. 
or it is, but it, we want it part of our model. Dwayne, you don't have to answer. I'm just giving you your time in case you want to. Okay. Um, I honestly have no idea what Steve would say to that. Um, just because it sounds like a board level thing, let's just all be frank with each other. There's nothing wrong with NADOG and IET overlapping in our goals, and let's be even more frank. I'm not sure the IET have succeeded, so let's go on. You know, let, you know what? <laughs> let, let, me, let me address that while I can. I, I'm not standing for election. I can just say whatever I want now. Um, I don't see any conflict, honestly. Um, we came up with our why completely independently of theirs. Um, we have the same mission, perhaps, to make the internet better. We go about it differently. The ITF doesn't exist for the same reason that Nano does, um, or they don't do the same things. Um, but if at the end of the day the goal is to make the internet better, what's wrong with that? And the ITF and Nano do, do actually do different things. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with both of them making the internet better. Do we have any other questions? Patrick? Patrick? Oh, sorry, I was trying to find somebody at this side of the room, but... <laughs> no, it's okay. Who are you? John Christoph from Comrie. So, um, then on the North American network operators, group, should we expand either geographically or to other constituencies? Because I think we primarily find people who are ISPs or hosting providers. So I have a question to anyone who wants to answer. Candidates? We have discussed that one. Um, historically, our name is Nanog, it's North American, and we do welcome people from other regions like Asia, Europe, Africa, Latin America. We're not a closed member group. Um, all other regions have also operator groups. They already exist. So we thought that we should keep with our name unless uh, the members see it that they, we should change. So then that sounds like a good... Uh, ballot for next year. <laughs> Any other candidates? Plus one. <laughs> AOL. All right. Um, as long as we're talking about other regions, is Wilson in the room? The Pascal, the Pastel Scholarship winner, his name is Wilson. He's actually from Uganda, which is, in case you didn't know, outside of North America. So <laughs> we do outreach a little bit past North America, but other than that, I'm going to leave the question alone for the candidates. Do we have any other questions? All right, so I'm going to put one more, um, one more, I don't know what to call it, emphasis, motivation, encouragement. Please vote. Um, I know I make a lot of jokes when I'm standing up here, but I am deadly serious. If you guys don't vote, then don't bitch about it. And we all know none of you could possibly live another day if you couldn't bitch about it. So you have to vote. Yes, sir. David Huberman from Quick question. Um, David Huberman. Hey, David. <laughs> He's too uh, tall. <laughs> uh, David Huberman from Aaron. Signed up for membership the first week it was available. That was a year ago. Am I eligible to vote now? Am I eligible to vote in the next election? And when does my membership expire? I can't find any of that on the Arrow website or on the NANA website. So the membership actually. Um, I really don't want to uh, do this because I don't have the website in front of me. The website should say, and I believe it does say, to be honest, that membership is $100 per year. Right. Uh, but it did not start the day of because we, we backed it up a little bit. Okay. Everyone who has ever paid membership up until sometime before this moment, I forget when the cutoff was, but everybody who has ever paid membership is eligible to vote in this election right now. Um, yeah. After... Uh, you will not be eligible in the next election unless you pay for more than one year. I, I believe you're correct, but you have to have been a member um, up as of a month ago to vote in this election. Right? Yeah, there was some cutoff. Yeah, I don't yeah I'd, I'd also point out that we were collecting donations. I'm, I'm long. incorrect. It's we, not we, a month ago. Yeah, <laughs> Nunak was collecting donations long before uh, we started. We had a membership structure, and those early donations were not memberships in that sense because we didn't have membership structure. Um, so. Some of them were converted to membership upon request of the people who donated. Right. Um, so anybody who has ever p paid for membership, not just a flat out donation, is eligible to vote in this up to some cutoff that is before right now, but I don't remember where the cutoff was, but it was, it was relatively recent. It, wasn't it was Friday. It was Friday. Yeah. Okay. Everybody who paid for membership before Friday, meaning two days ago, is eligible to vote in this election. 
If you paid for one year, you are not eligible for the next election because it's only one year long. Can you find a way to either contact us when our membership's expiring or make it evident, blah, blah, blah? Thing? Yes, we will be sending out email to people whose membership are, uh, are expiring. And then we'll go from there. Uh, useful and reasonable question. Does anybody else have one of those? All right, thank you very much. All right, um, before we start on the development update, uh, is Chris Casada out there? If you are, could you stand up and wave at us? If you're not, then you're probably uh, wise. Um, <coughs> so I wanted to uh, mention Chris uh, because um, he had to, has had to step down as chair of the development committee, um, but I don't want that to pass unnoticed. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody understands what a great thing that Chris has done for us over the last couple of years. He was um, in, at the beginning of what was then called the Marketing Working Group, which is when we started going out to the various vendors and saying, hey, why don't you give us some money in exchange for uh, uh, showing your stuff at the beer and gear and all that. I mean, Merritt used to handle a lot of that, but under the Marketing Working Group and recently under the Development Committee, that's become a lot more formalized and a lot bigger than it was. And I don't think it's uh, an exaggeration to say that without the efforts that Chris put in with the development committee, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have had the money to put this on. So if you see Chris, please thank him. Um, please tell him that uh, uh, we appreciate everything he's done for him and, and we hope uh, he'll be back working with us in some capacity soon. So with that said, um, I'd like to invite the acting chair of the development committee, uh, Misako, um, up to give us uh, an update on what's been happening in their, their realm. Hi hey everybody, my name is Masako. I've been uh, volunteering for NANOG for the last couple of years and uh, started out in the marketing, marketing working group with Chris and uh, through the transition we have worked to put together a lot of different programs and uh, thank you to the sponsors uh, for all their contributions, their feedback, everything that they have provided. I wanted to recognize some key uh, sponsors today um, are Diamond sponsors. We have Google, NDT, and VeriSign. And they have <laughs> <laughs> they have contributed huge amounts of money to um, see us through this transition, um, and we definitely couldn't have done it without them. Also, Alcatel Lucent is our silver sponsor, and they have also contributed a huge amount of time and. Uh, and money as well to get us to this point. Um, and then we can't forget our annual sponsors and our technology sponsors. Um, of course, you guys know the connectivity sponsors and then of course the hosting providers that provide servers for Nanog and, and um, help us run these meetings. So thank you to everybody. Um, I also want to, oh, we can <laughs> I also wanted to recognize some of the committee members as well. Um, through the last couple years, they have put in a lot of time to help support a lot of the programs. Um, they've, you know, set aside time during their work times to um, contact all our sponsors, and then also, of course, look for potential sponsors for the future. And um, I'd like to uh, have them all stand up. Val, are you here? <laughs> okay. How about Kat Hoffman? Kat. And then Gina? I don't see her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you guys. Okay, so I think this is something that you guys are very, very curious about as far as financials. Um, Dwayne will go over a lot more of the details, but I wanted to focus just basically on the development com committee and um, the numbers that have been coming in, and this is just pure sponsorship um, contributions. So for NANOG 52, we've had 227,333 dollars come in for that meeting, so this was Denver. And then for this meeting, for NANOG 53, we've had 261,500 dollars come in. Um, this is pretty much 15% uh, meeting over meeting increase. And um, I'm hoping to continue to refine some of our programs so that 
we can continue to increase that 15%, um, possibly up to 50%, 60%. A uh, reason for that is because we need this for the continuity of NANOG, and as every, a few of the board members have mentioned, we really do want to see these meetings um, continue and be comfortable and have that reserve so that if anything does happen that we are able to sustain ourselves, and I think that's very, very important. Um, and as we incrementally increase the revenue, the sponsorship revenue, I'd like to um, work with our committees and uh, see how we can pay off these loans um, pay and, and then of course future, uh, fund future NANOG meetings. And then another portion of these revenues uh, or the contributions um, should go toward NANOG programs. Again, as mentioned, the educational programs that really make this uh, organization what it is and then allow other new members and uh, new attendees to come to NANOG. So that's basically, yes. Hi, Randy. Can you define sponsorship, in other words, is this donation somebody just gave us? Is it a beer and gear? Mm -hmm. Is it lunches, et cetera? Just trying to understand since it's sure. such a significant part of the income. Sure. So sponsorship, uh, these dollars are actually a t uh, attached to a program. And these are programs you can see um, are articulated on the website. So if you go to um, the link, you will see all kinds of programs. Beer and Gear one, being one of our most popular. We also have Nog Lab. We also have, uh, of course, the overall sponsorships for hosting meetings, and then all the individual um, items that go along with that, which would be the lanyards we make and the batch or the agenda sponsorships. So there are um, little price points or sponsorship revenue uh, price points that we put uh, to these programs. They all add up to these numbers. So, yeah, if I might um, the, just, to be just clarify one thing, the, the, we also are, certainly would not turn down, uh, do not turn down donations if a company wants to give us cash or services or whatever, not as part of a program, we happily accept it. Um, the program is a little bit different. We call them donations, not sponsorships, but um, we're happy to take it. Yeah. Right. It, and, and it is just really sponsorship dollars. It does not include the contributions and or the membership fee. Different revenue line. Yep. Thank you. Hi, uh, Todd again. Um, one question about the sponsorship. So I know they were uh, in, in the older days now and didn't have these sponsorship programs, which may be why a number of the members are going to ask questions about what exactly is the program. Uh, so one of the questions is, how satisfied are you and how satisfied are the people who are buying sponsorships that we've done this right? Like, are we going to, we've got this silver, platinum, gold, uh, titanium sponsorship levels and whatever, right? Do, do those work? Do those work for us? Is it the right amount of money? Is it the right mix of benefits? And are we going to continue them into the future? It's never enough money. <laughs> well, of course we want more. Um, to answer the first part of your question, these programs definitely have worked. Um, they have worked because they have been um, set up and created specifically so that we can run these NADOC meetings, and it is aligned with um, not only what the sponsors are looking for, but what we as the attendees want. And we got a lot of this feedback from the surveys that we sent out um, throughout all of our meetings. And so they have been appropriately set up. Um, as far as sponsor feedback, they are very happy. Um, uh, of course, they want to more get more to our group and our community. Um, what the board has done and the development committee has done, however, is we are kind of um, squashing the idea that we're marketing as if we were um, attending a trade show. So that is one thing that we've kind of stayed away from. And as, as many of you have, um, said you really don't want those salespeople all over you and we have tried to respect your space and uh, your privacy here while you're attending the meeting so i think the programs are designed definitely to allow you that and then also at the same time have that revenue stream coming in I can. <laughs> Hi. austin with cornerstone communications uh, i was wondering if these are purely cash Sponsorships or are these in kind as well? It is purely cash. Thank you. As I said, we do happily accept in kind donations, but those are a different program. I think 
And I think it's important just because you asked the question, we do have a number of folks who are recognized on our website as contributors. So those, in, the uh, contributors are really the in-kind set of services that are offered to Nanon. I think it's important to mention that what the program, uh, the development committee, what the development committee has done and achieved this year is to decouple the sponsorship money from a meeting to meeting uh, ask. So we have yearly sponsorships. So uh, a sponsor can buy a full year, so sponsorship over three meetings, and they can also buy activities on a per meeting basis. So what the development committee has done is to listen to our sponsors that said, I really want to give you money, but you're coming to me at the wrong time in the year. So they've answered that. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Dwayne. Or turn it over to Steve. No, Dwayne. Dwayne, you can take it. So hi again. Um, for those of you that are on um, members mailing list and whatnot, these, these slides have been posted for a week or so. Um, so I, I may go through some of them kind of quickly since I think we're, oh, we're, is it 5.30 or no, 6.30? We're close to the ending time, aren't we? Anyway, um, the first slide shows the, the numbers from the previous meeting. This is NANOG 52. Um, we had 543 attendees. Um, you can read all the, the numbers there. The, the black lines are income, the red lines are expenses, and um, overall about $120,000 um, profit on that meeting. And I've also listed the, the costs per attendee and the registration revenue per attendee for that meeting. This slide shows the um, the state of uh, our, our expenses and revenues for 2011 up to the end of August. So um, again, you, you can sort of read the numbers there. Um, oh, it's cut off? I'm sorry. So the, um, in, in fact, on this slide, there's zero. <laughs> um, and, and the reason that, that they are on there, the, the reserve line and the loan repayment line are there um, because we, we plan on using sort of this the same set of categories for all the uh, all the other years and all the other uh, slides. So, yeah, in, in this in this data, they are zero. Um, so, could you, could you hit backspace twenty or whatever? Go back. Yeah. One. So one meeting had two hundred twenty-seven thou of sponsorship forward now. Sponsorship 207, and I'm so I'm really confused by Misaka-san's. Well, this is this is to the end of August. Oh. Year versus meeting versus. Right. Am I sponsoring beer and gear? Or am I buying years worth of beer? So a, a couple of things. And excuse me, I'm coming out of waking up from Rip, Rip Van Winkle State. Mm -hmm. You know where things were a little different. Right. Right. Um, so a couple of things. Um, the, the spring meeting of 2011 um, does not, go, does not uh, accumulate in, in, these, in these revenues because we didn't run that meeting. So, so, so uh, Miami? Pardon me? You mean Miami? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and this is to the end of August. So this, this sponsorship uh, amount here mostly represents the previous meeting, NANOG 52. A lot of the sponsors hadn't paid for NANOC 53 at the end of August. Okay, so in, in fact, if, if, if we had a, a more current financial report, that, that number would be a lot higher because we have gotten a lot of money in through September and the first part of this month. So our, our income, our revenue for sponsorships is a lot higher at this point. Right. So Randy's point is that a sponsorship is sold sort of on a yearly basis. You sign up to be a sponsor for a year, and then why are we sort of talking about per meeting sponsorships? Is, is that like 
yeah, this is just a cash versus accrual. If somebody gives you $100,000 and it's for three meetings, Randy wants to know how that shows up. Do you recognize that in the reports at 33, 33, 33 across the three meetings? Do you set something aside? Like, just what are, what are we supposed to see when, are, are you doing cash basis accounting or accrual it's, basis it's a, accounting? It's a accrual basis accounting. It's a accrual basis, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're not recognizing the full cash contribution at the time we receive it. Randy, can you go to a microphone if you keep talking, please? <laughs> there are people on the web, and hell, I can't even hear you. <laughs> I'd be insulted if I could hear that. Um, therefore, you took in significantly more than 270 cash up until the end of August, and you haven't realized it because a significant amount of it was due for future meetings because they brought a year's worth and you're on a cruel basis, question mark. I believe so, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, other thing to note here on, on this uh, slide is the, the loan from Aaron, $60,000 total. This slide represents um, actual budget numbers or actual numbers from um, the first two meetings of this year. I don't know, if, I guess it is cut off there a little bit. But um, as you can see, on both of those meetings, uh, you know, we're still coming out ahead. The, the, the second one, we came out um, quite a bit ahead. And if I may, since this is my fault, uh, the, on the slide that's on the screen right now for the Miami meeting, uh, the $373,000 number is combined registrations plus sponsorships, um, since we didn't have access to the uh, broken out numbers. Um, in Dwayne's version of the slides, that shows up in the middle of the two columns, but I did it wrong, so blame me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. So the, the, I forgot to mention that. The, uh, that number under the registrations for Nanoc 51 is really combined registrations and sponsorship. Uh, this slide shows the account balances as of, again, as of the end of August. Um, the operating account, again, is a lot higher now because we've had a lot of sponsorship money come in for this meeting. Um, and also, I wanted to take this opportunity to note that on the mailing list, we've talked about posting you know, more standardized uh, reports, and, and we're, we're working on that. If you, um, if you log into Arrow right now, and if you go to the Documents tab, you'll actually see a, um, uh, a balance sheet for, for, for the end of August. And when we get the uh, accounts reconciled for the end of September, um, then we'll, we'll post that as well and send out some, some notices. That probably won't happen until uh, a couple of weeks from now. Here are the estimates to, for the end of the year uh, finances. Um, for this meeting, for NANOC 53, uh, we budgeted, in our budget, we predicted about 500 attendees. and. I know that we're at about 560 already, so um, we're doing very well there. Should, uh, should be a little higher on registrations. This slide shows our, our budget for 2012. <clears throat> and um, here you can see that on the, on the expense side, the reserve and the loan repayments are no longer zero. So by the end of 2012, we plan on having um, $120,000 in reserve to pay for, uh, to cover liabilities for, for loan contracts and, and whatnot for um, future meetings. And we plan on paying back the loan that we have from Aaron. Uh, in Question, yes. 60,000, 95,000 interest rate or what? Um, we received 30,000 in 2011 from Aaron. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Todd on the road again. So, um, just a gross order of not like picking at the details, but it looks like we grossed 120,000 in the Denver meeting, and then we're planning on grossing for if you go back to 2011 for all of 2011, uh, we're hoping to uh, end up with 25k. So that makes so what that tells me is that you guys are expecting to lose a moderate amount of money on this meeting. Is that correct? No. No. I, I think it's a combination of being conservative and um, ongoing operations. Yeah, 2001, Todd, is only two right. meetings. You got to be closer. Right, 2011 <laughs> is only two meetings that are NUNOG. It's 52 and 53. Yep. 
Okay. Plus we so what's interesting is the next year, two thousand and twelve. But but all I'm saying is that it looks like in fifty two we had a gross margin of one hundred and twenty thousand, and it looks like you're projecting a gross margin for the entire year, including one other meeting of twenty five thousand. Okay. That's that only you a, expect to lose one hundred thousand on this meeting. No, it's it's a meeting accounting, and it doesn't account for the regular operations like AMS, uh, Verland. I see. Betty. So, okay. So either we as the membership are going to have to get used to that, or you guys are going to have to allocate operating expense per meeting. Because I'm still used to. You yes. can see why I end up at this position. It looks mm -hmm. like it throws off 120,000 per meeting, but at the end of the year we've got 25,000 to show for it, and that's confusing. It's a and, point. and and Duane will talk to about how we're going to share the um, quarterly financials with all of you. But the important thing I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Duane, but in the number that you see for 2012, one of the buckets is there's already in there, it's not on the line, but there is a set aside $120,000 reserve that's already taken out for liability. So I believe if you add it up, it's really 121 that's really net available to use. Okay. And this, by the way, this is fantastic news. I think all of us thought that Anog was self sustaining. Uh, could do even better and could do more. So I'm not criticizing at all. This is wonderful. I'm really just trying to understand. So thank you for the work. Randy Bouchard, IJ. There are fairly under, well understood standard ways of doing this um, and, and accruing expenses, accruing income properly, and reporting them recently, and, and I'm sure you'll find them and do them. And quarterly or meeting, I don't care what the particular reporting frequency is. I think a third or a quarter of a year is really nice. And a third may be easier for you because of the meetings and it's easier to amortize out that way. But things like reserves are not part of the income statement. And it's just little details. Okay, thanks. So also in our, in our 2012 budget, um, you know, we had specific estimates for the meetings, um, and those numbers are here. Uh, I think the attendance numbers are a little bit conservative, but, but that's the way we like them. Oh, and that's, um, that's the end of my slides. Are there any other questions about finances? Okay, thanks. Europe. Oh, Sorry. Very okay, what do I do here? I'll go. Maybe this is gonna go down. There we go. Sorry. I'll be quick. It's a very quiet group tonight. Lots of good questions though. And um, I just want to take a moment, it's not really on my slides, but to thank all of you that are here to join as members and really just participate in something that you own. We talked about voting and why it's important, but the underlying statement of everything that all of these folks are doing at this table is on behalf of something you own. And that's a tremendous, tremendous advancement for NANOG. So thank you, congratulations to everybody. My job is to share with you information that's already on the website, but to be available to answer any questions about where, go where we are going into the future. Um, one of the commitments that the board made as part of the transition was to go out there and secure venues in advance so that you could all schedule travel and, and everybody could have a better handle on what was coming up for the next 12 to 18 months. We've done that on your behalf. NANOG um, 54, our next meeting, is going to be hosted by Telex. It's February 5th through the 8th in San Diego. Uh, work is already underway. There's a web page up for San Diego, and the call for presentations will be released on about Thursday or so with registration information and all of that. So we're, we're improving the turnaround time to get the next meeting launched. After San Diego, we're going to Canada. We're going back. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> there it is. M multiple screens, sorry. Uh, we are going to Vancouver. Um, we haven't been back to visit 
in, Vancouver, in Canada a while, in a while, and uh, this would be a great meeting. Tata Communications is our host for that event. Nanar 56, next fall, we are again joint with Aaron, and we are going to Dallas, Texas. All really great venues, uh, exciting times for us, and uh, Terramark is again a host for us. We're in the process, I can't, it's to be announced, so I don't want um, to release too much information um, to take away our um, bargaining, if you will, with the hotel and, and such for Nanog 57, but we do have the date secured, February 3rd through the 6th, and we will go to someplace warm. So, um, and we have some folks who have came forward and expressed an interest in hosting Nanog 57, but we do not have anyone confirmed yet. So as a company or an individual, if you're interested in hosting a meeting, contact myself or Masako. We would love to talk with you about the new hosting model that we've put in place in the, next, the last year. Um, hopefully it's easier for all of you um, and a rewarding experience. So that's where we're going and uh, we'll probably take a little bit of a breath and uh, deal with some logistics issues before we uh, schedule more events. Questions? They want alcohol. <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> there you go. Open mic. It's you. So are there more questions that you wish to ask of anyone on the stage or the organization? This is your time. We're three minutes after. Oh, okay, what a surprise. Dave. <laughs> I am Dave Temkin, and I work for Netflix. Hi, Dave. Oh. <laughs> Again. Has <laughs> not been bought by IBM yet? Or, you know, just going to drive that margin zero and then let them pick up the carcass? Uh, anyway, <laughs> I, will, I will remind you that you're recorded. Uh, oh. You know, no, we want Quickster to buy us. <laughs> All opinions okay. are that of my own. Anyway, um, so uh, I started a thread, what was it, last month now, uh, regarding an idea for generating. Uh, both more interest in some of the committees as well as um, providing an incentive, if you will, to people who give upwards of 60 hours of their time for committees like the, the program committee uh, on a yearly basis, generally of their employer's time. I'm going to raise this because I'm crouching over. Uh, generally of their employee's time or employer's time in order to uh, contribute to the NANOC program. And um, there was a good amount of back and forth, uh, very respectful. Uh, what I was curious about was what the board's take on that was at this point, now that the finances have been looked at. Um, you know, we all saw the model that Dwayne put together as far as uh, what the finances were for the last few meetings. We saw what the surplus was. I think we understood it to be, um, you know, less than uh, something like $22,000 total in less revenue over the course of a three meeting year uh, to do it. And so I'd certainly like to hear the board's feedback from that. Uh, obviously, I know there's other people in the room who are opinionated the opposite side. I'm not going to provide commentary on that yet uh, until you know, we kind of get a response. OK. So we looked at that. And um, to your question, can we afford it? The answer is yes. Uh, it's estimated to be fifteen to $20,000. Per meeting. Per meeting. So under our current model, yes, we can afford it. But what we discussed is, is that something that you guys want? Is that something desirable? And that's where we would like to hear what you think about this. So as a board, what we can tell you that, yes, we can afford it. Uh, but we haven't decided if we, if uh, we were for it or against it. Dave, can you give a quick description exactly what you're 
referring to because not necessarily everybody was yeah, on that that's thread. Fair, that's fair. So, uh, and I believe that re technically that email only goes out at this point. I think only Future. members are subscribed to Futures, correct? No, no, no. 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 Futures, correct? Futures, futures is open. open. There's okay, a members at. Oh, but okay, it so only has like 400 is, people. It's closed, open. obviously. For some reason, I thought Futures at some point had also been linked to members in some way. So, uh, uh, as I alluded to earlier, my proposal was that for program committee members, or potentially, you know, we could also talk about any of the committees, uh, who attend a minimum amount of those committee meetings between meetings. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, if you calculate it out, it's usually about 60 hours a year of time, uh, you know, that are, is generally during the work day. So it's our employers who are graciously giving us this time uh, to use, to give back to the NANO community. Uh, in exchange for that, allowing the people who have contributed this time and this effort to these meetings to attend these meetings for free. Um, you know, everyone still certainly would have the option to pay if they felt like they, it was their obligation to pay. But, you know, I would like to think that if we're going to select someone for these committees that they could be trusted to choose whether or not it was appropriate for them to pay or not pay given uh, their uh, um, means of paying, whether that be their employer or out of their own pocket. Obviously, there needs to be some sort of guideline, like you attend X number of meetings, you give X number of hours, whatever that may be. Uh, you know, that could be up to the committee chairs, that could be codified in some way, whatever that is. So I just want to, um, speaking slightly for the board here, I just want to be clear that uh, when, this, uh, when this very first came out, the board took officially no position on it. At the time, we did not have the financials back yet. So just so that everybody knows, one of the reasons that we decided to do this is because we honestly did not know, and this was mentioned at the time, that we did not know what the financial impact would be. Now that we've seen the financials and we understand it, as Sylvia said, it's clear that we can afford this because we have somewhat of a surplus uh, on the meetings. Um, just so that you guys do understand, we make uh, a lot of money for the meeting, but as you saw on Dwayne's slide, that doesn't mean we make a lot of money for the year because we haven't uh, put all of the non-meeting expenses into that number that you saw, which was reasonably large for each meeting that we make some money on. So don't think that we're going to end the me every year with, you know, half a million dollars or something like that, because that is not the case. As you saw, at the end of 2011, we're $25,000 ahead. And if every committee member on every single committee does not pay a registration fee and comes to Nanog, that's the loss of $20,000 per meeting, not per year. So be clear on this. We think we can afford it. But it's not a slam dunk, and it's certainly not a non-trivial expense uh, in loss of revenue. Patrick, um, can I just ask how we get to that $20,000 per meeting number? Because if we go on 17 PC members this and then five marketing 17 PC members, six right. um, development members, three, right. committee, uh, three communications community members, six board members, times $450 each. It's $20,230, $20,250. I did the calculation myself. Uh, we also, by the way, added in, it was a little more than that because I ended up adding some members because if you look at the bylaws, it says things like the communication committee must have at least three members. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we added in some extra committee because right um, before Mike was um, selected to replace RS on the board, mm -hmm. the communication committee had four members. Right. So there are extra people involved. Okay. So we, we took a little extra and we figured out what it was and we were conservative about this. Right. In for a penny and for a pound, we didn't want to end up like saying, oh, well, we think we can make it if it's only the PC or something like that. Anyway, end of day, just want to let everybody know we think we can afford it. Um, it's something to discuss and we'd like to hear what the community has to say about it. We've heard some stuff on the mailing list. I'm positive somebody, I don't know who, is going to reiterate what they said on the mailing list. <laughs> um, but I would like to also hear if somebody else, um, uh, by the way, I'm not at all trying to tell Randy to sit down. He should say what he has to say. But <laughs> I would like also other people who haven't um, participated in the mailing list to go ahead and step up. One last comment just so that everybody knows. Nanog Futures talks about the future of Nanog. Duh. It is open to everybody. And believe it or not, Everybody who is a member is not subscribed to Nanog Futures. Don't ask me why, it just happens to be the case. So Nanog Futures is orthogonal to members at nanog.org, okay? Thanks. Randy? Randy Bush, IJ. Um, the finances are, of course, important, but I don't think they were the real issue. The real issue is classes of membership and We've been around this at least 
two, maybe three issues. The other one was whether there should be, I don't know, exalted members or fellows or something like that, etc. And each time, I think we're pushing something that's way at the bottom, is that as operators, we're peers. And this creates unevenness. And, um, but I believe there was universal support for, you know, folk who can't afford it should be supported somehow. But that, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the issue. And money wasn't the real issue. Though, of course, it had to be checked and you got to pay the bill. But it was classes. This is a one of the last Todd? Yeah. Three thousand. Uh, yeah, just briefly. So um, PC members, I, I'm much more experienced with PC members, having served on the PC in the past for a long time. Um, PC members are required to attend two out of three nanoms a year, and I think that makes good sense because people shouldn't be programming the content of a conference they don't attend. It doesn't make any sense. So that's great. But um, by virtue of being requiring PC members to attend those conferences, uh, we may tend to uh, move the PC towards a class of wealthy individuals or individuals employed by large corporations. Um, because uh, self-employed individuals on a margin um, you know, will be looking for other opportunities to spend that money. Now, there are PC members in the past who have griped about this. Some of them may be sitting on the far right of the stage. <laughs> and one of the good aspects of this um, has been that it's produced more content, right? Because we give speakers free attendance. So I think if we're going to look at this, we need to look at two things. Um, one is, I agree with Randy, there shouldn't be a separate class of people. But I do think that uh, PC members in particular, because of the requirement to attend, uh, should have the option to have their attendance waived if they think their company can't afford it or if they can't afford it. Um, but I also do think we need to look at free attendance for speakers as well um, and see is that, like that's actually the bigger subsidy that we have. Um, it's a good tool towards getting a certain amount of content and maybe, maybe we just leave that there. Maybe we just say, you know, committee members who want to get in for free should produce some freaking content for the uh, conference. It's worked for Professor Steenburgen on the corner there, so maybe it'll work for everyone. But that's just, I, I, I think we should consider the way it shifts who gets to attend and what the incentives are. So just, just so that I'm clear, Todd, what you're saying is you've volunteered, I think Dave said 60 hours, um, towards NANOG, and we're requiring you to attend the conference, and if you'd like to get this $450, 425 as Kat rightfully points out, because you must be a member already, so we're requiring you to be a member, we're requiring you to donate 60 hours of your time, we're requiring you to attend the meeting, and we're requiring you to pay that $425, and if you want that $425 waived, please go and do some more work. That's right. Okay, that's, just, just so that I'm clear. Fair. Yeah, that's right. And, and, I'm, and again, I think that's actually a fair way of saying it. And I, that doesn't all add up to, and that's wrong, right? I that didn't say it did. Right. I just wanted to be but clear yeah, on what you're saying. I think that's exactly the current state of affairs. And so we it is the current say, state. Are, that, are those the incentives we want, and are those the costs we want? That's fine. Um, yeah, that's right. Chris? I'll yield to Joe for a second. No, no, go ahead. That's all right. Go ahead, Joe. Joe, you're far more outspoken on this issue than I am. Please go. I'm not outspoken. <laughs> Go ahead. Back in reality land. Uh, Joe Provo, Nanog member. Um, Ooh, I, I, like I realized I had something. See what I did there? <laughs> See what I, did? Uh, I realized I had something just in a draft folder that I shot, shot off this, uh, this afternoon on, on this topic. And it's that, A, I don't think we should be going down the road of codifying anything because that gets in the micromanagement that we've been attempting to avoid in the in the structure of any of the bylaws and documents. Um, beyond, we already had some leeway that was during during the merit days for the then SC chair to waive a few hardship cases. Um, we should, if codifying anything, uh, recognize the, the hardship um, and just go ahead and tack on a uh, that, while I agree with both Randy and Todd's um, um, points, uh, go ahead and say, and if somebody's been doing exemplary work, we certainly expect the chair of the board, for instance, to go ahead and say, yeah, you're good. Um, to Patrick's point, 
yes, we asked them to do some more work, but um, all the requirements for being on the PC, they knew before they signed up. If they had problems with that, they shouldn't be running. That's it. Chris? Chris Leiter, uh, now I'm member. Uh, <laughs> um, let me say, to start out with, I don't believe that uh, waiving membership fees is a creating of a two-class system because for most of those committees you're going to term out anyway and you're going to be returned to the plebe class. So I'm not, I'm not sure that, that I agree with that. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with waiving registration fees for committee members. Um, it's probably an intriguing way to get more people to actually want to volunteer to run for uh, office or to be appointed to the committees. But I'd like to say that when we're talking about the hardship aspect of things, if we're really serious about you know, the hard, hardship issue, I think we should probably be more focused on um, putting more into our scholarship fund and sponsoring people who truly can't attend our meetings before we subsidize the people who are going to be here anyway. So I'd, I'd support doing it, but I'd, I'd support doing it after we, we got more people here on scholarship. Uh, Richard. No. So, I, I was going to say, um, you know, as Todd points out, I, I was on the PC for four years and I complained bitterly the entire time they didn't get me in for free and I had to actually turn out content too, which was not a bad thing. But the reality is you've got a lot of people who are doing a lot of work and not everyone works for big companies. Not everyone can afford to just have these things paid for and show up at every meeting. There are people who want to contribute and they shouldn't be called out as a hardship case. They shouldn't be, it's not right to look at it like that. There are people who want to contribute. There are people who do way more than the minimum amount of work required. And I think they deserve a little something for the amount of work that they put into this. Mohit Lad, uh, I'm on the Nanak PC. Uh, so I have two points to make real quick. Uh, one was regarding the, the point raised earlier that uh, PC members know what they're signing up for before they do. And uh, the counter that I would like to put there is that a lot of times managers change, your own job titles change, and your own jobs change. So that's not always the case over the two-year period. Um, the second point that I wanted to ask is uh, we've discussed the whole black and white situation. Either you pay everything or you don't pay anything. Has there been uh, like a 50% discount uh, kind of situation discussed before? Because that's a balance between uh, you know, the financials and getting some recognition for putting time on the PC. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, David Huberman from Aaron again. Um, it's October 2011. This is the first meeting wholly on our own. Um, I would urge the board to be second meeting. I would urge the board to be fully conservative. Maybe for the February 2013 meeting when you've had a full year's worth of meetings mm -hmm. to really understand what your finances really look like and not what they look like right now. Um, I just think this discussion is premature until you have a real handle on, on what your finances are gonna be and re if you really can afford to do this. Thank you. Hi, my name's Patrick. Oh, sorry. I'm a NANOG member. I've been silent on this issue up to this point um, because I, I've been told in the past that I have a really loud voice so I'm gonna whisper. Um, I also didn't want people to think that I was speaking for the board, but this is the community meeting and I'm speaking for myself, not for the board. So the way I look at this is that, first of all, I think it's completely wrong to assume that we're creating two classes of membership. Or you can go ahead and assume it is two classes of membership and yeah, somebody who volunteers and puts their time in, they're a different class and I'm okay with that. Either way you think about it, I don't care. What I think about is if Nanog could write a check if Nunog Incorporated could write a check for $425, you get somebody to put the 60 hours or whatever it is that people like Dave and Raz and Dave, sorry, two Daves, and uh, you know everybody on the PC or the people on the PC who actually contribute. If we could write a check for $425 and get them to contribute that, I wouldn't blink. I would do it in a heartbeat. In fact, I would jump for joy to do it. We had, before this meeting started, before people that were sitting up here and a couple people out in the audience went and physically buttonholed, literally physically attacked people and asked them to volunteer for the PC, we had seven open slots, and we had seven volunteers. We have four open board slots. The people standing for it are either sitting on this table 
or have already donated almost as much time as a normal board member. Not one other person stood up. Not one. You guys talk about this stuff and nobody's doing it. And part of the reason, not the only reason, part of the reason is because I've talked to people who say I would like to but and they need something and letting them come to the meeting that they helped create, that they put the effort into doing on their own without asking their employer, without asking for a hardship case, which honestly is really demeaning, without doing something like that and just saying, please, you worked really hard on this. I mean, name another organization that puts on a, anything, a concert, a meeting, a fair, and anything, and all the volunteers that show up who work the meeting, who work the concert, who work the fair, and say, wait a minute, before you come in, give me some dough. Not one, I can't think of one, literally, that isn't a flat out charity. And as much as we like to talk to ourselves as a charity, we're actually not a flat out charity. It's nice to give people, you know, we can talk about scholarships and it's important. I personally carry, you know, um, I personally helped Wilson show him who people were around here today. He's the Postel Scholarship winner this year. And I think it would be great if we had two of those. I think it'd be even greater if we had a contested election. And that's my view. Just before you go, Randy. Randy, Randy. Just a minute, Randy. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. So we are over time. I think this is an important conversation. I just want to call it out. So should we give ourselves another seven minutes and close at 15? And I'm sure we can find we can find more time to discuss this. But we do we do have Comcast as a host who is um, having a welcome social for us. Thanks, Randy. Randy Bush, IIJ. I occasionally donate a little time to organizations, including this one. And when the call went out, and especially when the second call went out, I said, you know, I, I could do it again. And I went and looked. And my criterion wasn't whether I could come up with 450 bucks. My criterion is which do nothing blowhards I would have to listen to for two years. And there were too many of them. Hey, let's be clear. Everyone sitting up here donated all their time. Not one of us has ever been paid a cent for any of this. And if you don't think that we put in a lot of time, you are confused. There's a lot of blowhards. If you really think somebody's going to join the PC and do the work, Remember, we're talking about doing the work, not just joining the PC. If, so, if you really think somebody's going to join the PC for $450, $425, and we're not going to let them skate. But you're really talking $1,275. Mm. No, no. He's talking about why, he, Randy said he's talking about why he didn't volunteer. No. He's giving his point of view. Right. But, but and it's 850 because you only have to go to two. But you, if you went to three. Yes, it would be $1,275. Mm -hmm. Still not you know, a fairly small amount of money for the amount of work that people put in. I, I, don't think that the, I, I, I can't imagine that when you look at the budget that we're talking about that, that the money is the big deal because it, it's not a lot of money to the organization. And if our development chair is as good as her uh, track record so far, it should become less and less of an issue as we go on. So I don't think that the money is the issue. If the money's not the issue, then it's obviously people's own personal opinions on whether those seats should be, should be free or pe whether they should have to pay, just like everybody else. And, and quite honestly, from my opinion, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter which way it goes. If you think that people should be compensated for their time, I'm fine with that. And you as a board, you have my permission as a member to make that decision for us. Um, but if you think that that's been this way and it should continue to be this way, you should pay just like everybody else, I'm fine with that too. You guys make up your minds. Owen? I, I have to, Owen DeLong, Hurricane Electric and Nanog member. Uh, I have to agree with Patrick. I, I've, I've not seen any other- Can somebody words. write this date down? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know, it's, it, it is bizarre. And, and I'm agreeing with, uh, with, with, with Raz too, which is really, you know, And Patrick and Raz just changed their point of view just now. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Anyway, um, th there is no other organization that I'm aware of that, that makes you pay for the privilege of serving the organization uh, other than Wright. 
um, <laughs> which is a whole different thing. Um, uh, right, right board members not only get their um, no, membership. But if, you, if you speak at a right conference, for example, you still have to pay for right. the conference. But right board members not only get their attendance free, they get their travel paid. So, so I, I think that you know meeting attendance for the the committee members is is a bare minimum. I think that the fact that we have such a dismal slate of and I'm not talking about the quality of the candidates. I'm talking about the fact that we have a number of candidates that barely equals the number of open positions um, is, is a dismal state. And, and I think that this organization deserves better. And I think that the way to get uh, a better set of choices is to make it easier for people to volunteer. And if giving them free meeting attendance is what it takes to do that, then I think that's the least we can do as an organization to support that and make the organization healthier and more viable. Thank you. So we'll go, we have four more minutes, one minute each. Three people at the mic and there's room for one more. Please mm -hmm. stand up. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, they, uh, I think Fergus was first, right? Sure, Fergus. Yeah. Hi, uh, Fergus Mackay, Flex Optics. Um, I'm a right working group chair. Um, I'm a chair within the right community. I don't get my expenses paid. The RIPE NCC, which is the executive arm of the RIPE community, has an elected board that gets expenses, but none of the working group chairs, none of the PC people get their expenses paid for free meetings. Thank you. Uh, so, Dave Temkin, you know. Uh, so, basically, I, I wanted to echo a point that Patrick made, which is, you know, a lot of people have brought up, well, we should create a, a hardship case. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many people have gone to school with people who, you know, may have been underprivileged, but no one really liked the feeling of having to know that their parents had to go ask for a subsidized lunch. And I'm pretty sure that no one wants to have to go to the NANOC board and ask for a subsidized registration. Uh, you know, it, it's demeaning to some extent. I guess people could get over it, but uh, I doubt many people would use that, and we would end up losing people who otherwise may not be able to attend. Uh, the other side of that as well is that our employers who have generously given this time for us to use here uh, should not be forced to pay for this and or we shouldn't be forced to pay for it out of pocket uh, if, if our employers have contributed our time to this process. Thanks. Thanks. Joe? I'm used to Patrick misunderstanding me, so I didn't react then, but since I, I obviously said what I was saying incorrectly, if Dave misunderstood me, I was saying we have a precedent for hardship case. We have a precedent for uh, former SC chair, now chair of board, discretion in that. I say if we wish to codify something, then we should have the discretion that not, you know, or separate from the hardship case, just say that you know committee members that actually do the bloody work by some criteria that, as you alluded to before, would be would be uh, uh, comps, not just a blanket comp whereby somebody who could skate, and we have, Patrick, had people who skated. And we may still do, I don't know, I'm not inside. Um, so, so we wouldn't just give uh, freebies to the people who, who skate. Just, just so everybody knows, as far as I know, and somebody can help me here, new NOG in the, this meeting and the last meeting, which are the only two new NOG is run, we have not comped anybody who wasn't a speaker um, or, or a sponsor when they get so many for being a sponsor, is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, just a data point, not trying to say anything else. Chris, what, last intervention? Yep, yep that's all I got, uh, and I'll be fast. Um, I mean, could we try it? You know, try it for a couple of, you know, a year or something like that? And if we have a positive uptake in, in uh, people who want to apply for uh, positions or stand for election, could we then say, oh, this is a good program, let's keep going. If we don't have a positive uptake in the same, in the, we're in the same place next year, where we have the same number of people who want the same number of positions, maybe we could say that this isn't, <laughs> this clearly isn't working. I mean, I, I would think that that would be the next logical step, is that if we're truly not getting qualified candidates for, our, for the positions, and the reason, one of the reasons why we're not, is because it's a hardship on them, or they're not getting comped, or their employers don't want to send them, or what have you, then, then if we see a huge uptake in people who want these positions, then we'll know that this, this program has worked. If we still have the same, we're still at the same place, then obviously we probably have better places to spend 22,000 some odd dollars or what have you. 
If you're saying should we test it, just realize this entire thing is a test. I, I got, I got you. I, and and no, I'm, I'm, I got you, Patrick. But I'm just saying that people are saying there's a lot of people that are saying and have voiced their their opinion on futures that you're going to get better slate of candidates if you do this. And I'm saying, okay, I don't necessarily have an objection to that. Why don't we try it and see if it works? If we get a better slate of candidates, we know that it works and we can go forward with it. If we get the same, if we're in the same place next year, then we know that this didn't work and we should probably say it's a waste of twenty-two thousand dollars. That's a good suggestion. So we will close for now on this um, on this topic. So I encourage you all to come to the social um, that's put out by Comcast, our host. It is at the Comcast Center, 1701 JFK Boulevard in Philly. Um, and use that social time to continue the discussion. Thank you. Yay! Thank you. Also